Welcome to our third forum. This is your opportunity to meet and get to know Dr. Ellen Young, Associate Provost at CSU Fresno. I am Elva Maldonado Colon, Chair of Elementary Education and Chair of the Provost Search Committee. Before we proceed with the agenda, I would like first to introduce the other members of the Provost Search Committee, since this is our last time, and then share the processes for this session and other events that will follow. Members of the Provost Committee, please stand as I call your name. Uh, Stephen Browns, Associate Dean of Undergraduate Studies. Shannon Bros, Professor of Biological Sciences. Some of our people have to teach. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sandy Hirsch, <laughs> Director of School of Library and Information Sciences. Wei Shen Li, Faculty, Counseling Services. Ginny Ree, Professor of Medi Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Cecil Robert, a Student Representative. Beth Pontil, Chair of the Academic Senate and Lecturer on Communication, Disorder, uh, Communication Studies. Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> Thank you very much. In addition, our efforts in the search have been supported by an outstanding team from the Office of the President. Particularly, we would also like to acknowledge Vero Phillips, Chief of Staff, and Mireya Salinas. Both of them have been wonderful in our providing support to this committee. <laughs> After my short brief remarks, Dr. John will make a presentation for about 10 minutes. And this will be followed up by questions from the audience for about 40 minutes. To pose your questions, please walk up to one of the two microphones at the front of the stage. When we are through, we hope that you will provide feedback to the committee through one of two available opportunities. First, completing the written, uh, the written form available here today, those orange pages, or salmon, and then go into the, or go into the Provost Search a link that is on the president's homepage, and please make sure that we get your feedback uh, by either today or those of you doing it online or taking it with you by Mon Tuesday at noon, because we need to do the counting and the processing that afternoon so that we can then report to President Kayumi and have our meeting on Wednesday. Uh, back to Dr. Young. Uh, currently, Dr. Young holds the position of Associate Provost at CSU Fresno and was previously Associate Dean at the in the College of Health and Human Development at CSU F Fullerton. Dr. Young received her doctorate from Princeton University in Cognitive and Developmental Psychology. She's been very active, attending to the needs of diverse um, individuals on campus. Dr. Young has opened multiple opportunities for professional development that impact students, faculty, and staff. Her published work centers on empowerment, learning, and service. Welcome, Dr. Young. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's very exciting to see relatively full room of, of faculty, staff, and administrators. Uh, last night I was supposed to meet with uh, students, and it was a Sunday night, and it was kind of a little bit drizzly. So unfortunately, we only had one student, uh, your student body president, who stopped by. Unfortunately, he couldn't stay. He said his car um, had been towed, and so he was... <laughs> So he was going to try and go back, go back and retrieve his car before 6 p.m. So I had a wonderful conversation with Cecil, uh, who's a great representative of your undergraduates here, really powerful uh, young woman on the rise. Um, but I hope I have an opportunity. Are there any students here today? One student, two, stu two students, yay. Uh, so if I have time, I'd love to hear from, from the students as well, because uh, that's what makes a university is the, the vibrancy of our students that, who are here to help in the learning process. Um, I'm just kind of curious uh, of the group in here. I kind of want to get a sense of what, who my audience is. How many of you are faculty? Please raise your hand. Ah, fabulous, about a third. How many are staff? Ooh, wonderful, great. And how many are administrators? 
Oh, wow, okay, it's almost the third, the third, the third, a little more staff, so that's, that's terrific. Thank you so much for being here and taking time out. Um, and, you know, searching for a provost is a, it's a monumental and important critical job on the campus, so I sincerely respect uh, your uh, willingness to come and join and be part of the process and uh, really appreciate that very much. Um, just as far as a little bit of background and, and information on me, I did bring um, a more detailed biography, um, so I'll, I'll leave this with Elda and she can pass this out as needed. Um, when I was uh, told I was going to be a, a finalist for this position, they told me you have three paragraphs, <laughs> and that wasn't quite enough, so I, uh, I, my actual biography is, is quite a bit longer, and it's in tiny font, so I'm sorry if you have to get out your glasses to read it, but uh, that is a little more comprehensive in terms of what my uh, past experiences and accomplishments are. But uh, by way of summary, I was told to give you a quick summary, and then maybe a five, ten minute summary. So I'm just gonna, I'd rather have more questions, and so I'm passing out my more uh, extended biography, but let me summarize by saying a few key things about myself. Um, first, I want to um, mention that uh, as with your present Kiyomi, um, faculty governance and transparency and open discussion and dialogue collaboration are key. Uh, foundational principles and values that I hold very dear. So in all of my activities, wherever I have been, I have been uh, very active in seeking consensus, always being willing to listen, and to have constructive dialogue and exchange um, on any kind of variety of issues. Um, so just in terms of my past experience, I have been um, faculty senator. Uh, from the day I got tenure, um, I was asked to be on the executive committee. And at that point, as a relatively uh, you know, new junior faculty member, now moving into tenure status, I didn't really understand what a Senate was back in those days. And um, some of my senior colleagues says, yes, you should be a senator. Most of my work up until that point had been as a faculty uh, person, and I also did a lot of research, uh, assistance with student development programs. I directed the Office of Educational Equity, I directed the faculty uh, mentor program, which was a university program for faculty to mentor students. And, um, and in, in that role, I sent out lots of, this was before email, sent out lots of flyers and information about attracting um, you know, university mentors and so forth. And as a consequence, when I ran for um, the Senate, um, and, and on my campus, you usually wait till you become tenured before you sit on the Senate. Other campuses are different. Um, but so I ran for Senate and I had the highest number of votes of anyone on campus and the current sitting chair of the Senate said, who is this Ellen Jun? <laughs> and it was simply because name recognition, I had done a lot on the campus to uh, work in the student arena, networking faculty and students together. So that's how I ended up on the faculty um, uh, executive committee, the Senate, and started working across divisions, across uh, units, colleges and so forth. Um, as a result, um, over time, different uh, administrative positions became available and I was asked to, to stand into those positions and have been just so blessed to be able to have had an opportunity to work in many different divisions across the university. Uh, one of my areas, uh, several areas of expertise, one of which is the area of program development. So um, it is something that I really very much enjoy doing, um, either developing a program or supporting the development of new programs that will address issues for uh, faculty and for students in developing new curricula, such as a, uh, online, um, online degrees, as well as a master's degrees, and now we're working on a joint uh, doctorate nursing practice with San Jose State and Fresno State. So it'll be your first doctorate, so that's really exciting new achievement for this campus. Um, second area of expertise is in academic technology. So back in the late 1900s, um, I was asked by the provost and the president to become the director of what we called the Faculty Development Center. The way I envisioned that was a comprehensive one-stop shop where faculty could receive assistance and um, you know, uh, workshops, programs of support in everything from academic technology to teaching and learning to service learning to faculty um, chair support for part-time faculty for research support and so forth. So it was a really big operation that we were focused on trying to assist faculty in making the work of teaching and working with students um, more uh, easier and more efficient. And then also, um, you know, in terms of uh, faculty morale and, is and issues, community building. 
um, one of the other things I did in that role was to create something called the University Club. And the University Club was a club that was open to all faculty and staff for the purposes of community building. A lot of us, when we come to work, you are just working with those in your offices and you don't get a chance to meet other people from across the division. So the University Club was we would create little um, events, sometimes cultural events, sometimes um, campus events. Like for example, uh, we would pick out a, um, a show that was being a play, a performance, or a musical. And we'd arrange for everyone to come ahead of time, we'd have dinner with the director, um, and then go watch the show. Or we could watch the show and then have dinner with the director afterwards, if it was matinee, and then ask questions. So that was a chance for faculty and staff uh, as well as students were also invited. So community building is something that's also very important to me. Um, uh, the other area of expertise is academic technology. I serve as the senior academic technology officer on my campus, so very conversant with the new technologies that we can use to engage our students. And, um, and I was talking with some of the other faculty in the search committee today also about how these technologies might in some way help to reduce uh, the workload on faculty by using automa automa automation of certain kinds of low-level things, such as homework and so forth. So those are things that we're actively exploring uh, at the Fresno campus. The other final area of expertise is in the area of diversity. Um, that is something that, again, is uh, fundamental to one of my core beliefs. And so what I've done is to develop the uh, university uh, um, diversity plan for the Fresno State, our first one, uh, that will be in alignment with the university strategic plan. I have 21 members on the committee, plus another 10 community members. We're going through that formal process now, utilizing the framework that's been um, adopted by AACNU, so a nationally recognized organization in the area of diversity. Um, similar to that is that I've been um, developing a number of organizations on our campus, both at the Fresno and at Fullerton. So for example, when I got to Fresno, we didn't have, there was a black faculty and staff, there was no Latino faculty and staff, there was no Asian faculty and staff, so we designed, uh, wrote um, bylaws, constitution, I got their bylaws, their websites up and running, so we have elected officers in those two other areas, plus we developed the Women's Campus Connection, plus I developed the RACE, which is researchers and critical educators, faculty and staff are, uh, part of both of the, all of these organizations, and um, also the UFO, and the UFO stands for Untenured Faculty Organization, so <laughs> they like to think of themselves as aliens in a strange land <laughs> until they get the toga uh, of tenure. Um, so it's been a great deal of fun being uh, at this level. Uh, once you get to the senior level, you have the opportunity and the resources that you can allocate and help uh, grow many exciting things on a campus. And San, San Jose is one of those exciting campuses. Uh, first of all, you're historic in that you are 153 years old, or maybe it's 154, it's incredible, the first in the system. And to be uh, located here in the hotbed of the Silicon Valley, and with such diversity all around you in the community and the region, it's incredibly um, wonderful, wonderful uh, situation that you all are uh, part of. And then to have a new president who has such incredible energy, uh, as Mo has um, already shown in his other prior uh, positions at East Bay and elsewhere, I think it would be um, exciting, exciting to join you all here. I've read a lot of uh, the kinds of things that the faculty have done here, your scholarship, um, the, the really cool courses that you have as part of the Metropolitan University, the first year experience, you read those, those course titles and I think, oh, I would love to take that course. So the creativity um, of the faculty here is something that very much attracts me as well. So that's sort of a quick synopsis and I would be happy to take your questions. So please fire away. Oh, you're also bashful. <laughs> yes, yes. Hi, my name is Samantha Schwartz. I work with Indiana Affairs. Yes. Um, I think here that you are the PI for a 3.18 million pioneer Title V Hispanic Serving Institution grant. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Oh, I'd love to talk about that. Thank you for mentioning it. Um, as I said, diversity is an issue that I'm very committed to. And in the new normal, this new normal that we call today, where uh, our state legislatures are shrinking their commitment to higher ed and to the California Compact, as tragic as that decision is, the only way to continue to support our students is to bring external revenue to the campus, correct? So I was able to um, uh, secure a Title V, it's a um, HSI, Hispanic Serving Institution grant, to close the graduation gap on our campus. We have 36% of our students at Fresno State are Latino, which is uh, very high. It's among the highest in the system. Um, here on your campus, you have about 20%, 22%. And which made me a little bit sad because uh, if you have 25% or more and also that are Pell eligible, then you are eligible to apply for this grant. So right now, San Jose is not eligible to apply for HSI funding. You have to have a minimum of a quarter of your student body in that category. But uh, so what we did at Fresno is I applied for the grant. It's a five-year grant, 3.187 million. And our, we're trying to close the graduation gap. Um, we have a 16% graduation gap between our Latino students and our non-Latino. So even though we have a very high uh, relative to San Jose's graduation gap, uh, rate in six year time, um, our Latino students still lag. So what we did in this grant is, it's a five year grant, is to design a series of activities and programs to better support our Latino students. So, um, in many cases, Title V grants tend to focus on the student affairs end, that is to give more support for advising, for uh, cult feeling of cultural belongingness, for um, activities that center on the student affairs ex outside of the uh, classroom experience. What was different about my grant is that I focused a little bit more, uh, half of the grant goes towards funds to improve teaching, so to improve um, course redesign to use technology to try and assist students. And one example of this is that we were able to pilot test um, a partial course redesign in our Biology 10. It's the large enrollment, high failure rate course for GE for non-majors. And by uh, piloting a course redesign where you just more use of technology, more use of active learning, more use of other kinds of pedagogies, we reduced the failure rate in one semester from the spring, we got the results back from the spring, um, by usually a 20% failure rate in that class, and it was cut in half. So only 10% were failing. But remember, there's 2,000 students that go through this, so that means it's also in a tremendous savings in the department, right? Because the department doesn't have to hire all these part-timers to teach all the students who failed the last semester, not to mention the new ones coming in. And then plus it speeds their rate of graduation. They don't have to retake the course to go to the next course. So it has multiple benefits, and the, the really cool thing is, couldn't believe the results, but the failure rate for the underrepresented groups was dramatically changed by this course redesign, such that the African American students were, um, you know, passing at three times the rate from before, that the Latino students were passing at twice the rate from before, and um, the Asians and whites were roughly the same, no gender differences. So at, on the basis of that, I went out and sought another grant. So now we are uh, going to be part of the APLU, American Public Land Grant University, partnership with Carne Carnegie Mellon's um, Online Learning Initiative and uh, the Gates Foundation. So we met with them in San Francisco two weekends ago, and they're coming out to visit our campus. Um, we're working with the community college in this regard as well. So um, we will have the thought, they'll only, they, APLU choose only five courses to be redesigned as national models. And so Fresno will be the national model for the Biology 10 GE course. So that is something that I've always wanted to try and seek external funding and then to get recognition, national recognition, for the faculty who actually do this work and then to showcase the students who succeed as a result. So it's very cool. Our bio faculty are so jazzed. It's just so fun to be around them because they just are just so jazzed about this opportunity, working with Carnegie Mellon and Gates and so forth. So it'll be a, a wonderful um, project and you'll probably hear more in the future. So that's a short synopsis. Maybe it wasn't so short, but, but thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for coming and sharing your career with us today. Um, I'm Kenneth Peter. I'm a professor of political science oh. and a longtime member of our academic senate. Yes. Uh, and so I'm intrigued by your experiences on your senate. Uh, 
However, you have gone over to the other side. <laughs> the dark side, I know. <laughs> Not necessarily the dark side, but as political scientists say yes. about uh, executive leaders, yes. uh, what you see really depends upon where you sit. Yes. And that is, uh, once you become a member of an administration, you have access to different people and yes. you have access to different information. You will have a different perspective, perhaps, on some issues than you had when you were on the academic senate as an elected representative. So, can you think of some issue or some policy or something that's happened uh, where you've gained a perspective uh, that you would not have had when you were on the academic senate, uh, which may have led to some conflict? Mm -hmm. And what did you do or would you do to resolve uh, such a difference of perspectives? First, can I shake your hand? Because I, I, I want to say thank you because uh, one of my close friends is um, Vince Buck. Yes, and he told me about, oh, you hope you meet uh, Dr. Peter because <laughs> <laughs> Vince Buck is, a, he's like the perennial, the iconic senator. Uh, and he was one of my mentors, if you, you can ask him about me. But um, when I was at uh, Fullerton, he was one of the ones that said, you need to run and then his, his, the Senate chair was Keith Boyum at the time, and Keith is the one that said, who the heck is Ellen Jen? But, well, so thank you. <laughs> well, no, uh, but it's a very good question. Um, I can say that even though, you know, it, it, all jokes aside, people do say when you go into administration, it's the dark side, and there are all these metaphors that imply uh, backroom politics and smoke-filled rooms and uh, undisclosed, you know, uh, secret handshakes and so forth. Well, in my view, that's just, you know, there, there is a perception that that's the case, but that is not in my worldview. And um, I'll just give you one example. Uh, if you follow ASCU, which is the American Association for State Colleges and Universities based in D.C., um, they rolled out, I think it was in 2010, the summer of 2010, they rolled out something called the Red Balloon Initiative. Did any of you hear about this? I don't know. Did San Jose, I don't think you officially joined. Correct? But you talked about joining it, and then everyone said, no, we don't have any time, or you didn't, you didn't even talk about it. But you heard about it. Statewide. Oh, you heard at Statewide Senate, right. And I think at Statewide Senate, there was actually some conversation about how Fresno had joined, and that it was a top-down thing. Well, this is, I want to tell you what really happened. And you can see a lot of this, it's on the website, the Fresno website. It's not been updated. We've had web problems. We're shifting over to a new content management system. But nonetheless, um, President Welty, who's the president of uh, Fresno, of course, I believe he used to sit on the board of ASCU and, uh, and has been a longtime supporter. And we generally go to the ASCU conferences when we can. They usually have very interesting, cutting edge topics and uh, speakers that help um, give a larger national view and sometimes an international view of what's happening in higher ed and what to look for and be wary of. So at any rate, uh, President Welty sent the email to me when, it's, when the call from the presidents from Muriel uh, went out to the presidents across the nation and said, join the Red Balloon Initiative, right? So he sent it to my provost and myself and usually when the president does that, it's an, un an, not a, it's an in uh, what's the word? implicit thing of saying, we need to stand up and say, yes, we're going to do it, right? But he needed the academic affairs to stand up because most of the red balloon had to do with changes in academic affairs. It was called reimagining undergraduate education, okay? Reimagining in the context of the 21st century, right? What can we change about the way we do and think about the university now with all the technological advances and so forth? And, and George Mahaffey, who's running the red balloon, is a wonderful man. If you ever get to meet him, he's fabulous. And uh, he writes this very interesting concept paper. So we joined. So President Walty said, yes, I want you to raise your hand and say we're joining. So we joined. And that's the, and I think he sent that to me in, might have been April or May, maybe May, maybe May. So there was very little time. And so what I um, thought about, I read the paper carefully, thought about how we would be able to imagine change. And they, and they were, uh, George was asking universities to imagine change in at least five different areas, right? And the areas were things like institutional organization and infrastructure. How could we change that for the better? Another one was faculty workload. How can we conceptualize faculty workload? Another one was curriculum. Another one was uh, pedagogy and, um, uh, instruction. And then the fifth one was enrollment management. 
okay? Those are all very much sort of academic side of the house, right? But it could involve everyone. It was ideally meant to involve everyone from across campus, whether you're student affairs, administrative services, et cetera. So if we were going to really mount a university uh, membership in this campaign, how would we go about it? So I thought back to how I typically have done things in the past, and I, I have to thank Fullerton for this model, is that the Fullerton campus has a very strong faculty governance um, piece and participation, has always had it that way. Sometimes people even call it the Fullerton way. And uh, so that's where I grew up. That's where you know, I essentially earned tenure and everything. So um, I thought about the process that I would feel comfortable using, and I then met with the president and the provost and said, well, I'd be happy to, to help run the um, Red Balloon Initiative for the campus, um, but I think what I'd like to do is do it in conjunction with the Academic Senate Executive Committee. And they both were quiet for a moment. Are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> because it's not always the case that um, administration, the provost office, works directly with the faculty senate to generate ideas for the entire campus. Right? Usually there's a ch chain of command and you might run um, ideas and initiatives through your chain of command if you're a provost. So uh, they gave, gave me their blessing and we went ahead. So we started with many, uh, we started with a dinner at my house and the president of the provost came and said yes, we're glad that the Senate would, would be interested in doing this. So Michael Caldwell was uh, kind of a co-chair with me as we, we started the process. And um, the way it rolled out is we had many meetings. There, I think all told there might have been more than 25 meetings over the course of a year where the steering committee, which involved uh, the executive committee, the academic senate, not every single person uh, came to every single meeting. And we planned out what it is that we wanted to do. So in the fall, we brought out George Mahaffey, who talked about um, the concept of the red balloon and how we might start imagining discussion. And then uh, that was a big keynote in November, early November. And then we started the um, process of creating task forces. There were over 90 faculty. About 200 people showed up for the original keynote, um, including all from every sector of the campus. And then we divided them up into four uh, task forces. Um, so those four task forces then were all led, team led in many cases, by members of the Academic Senate. Um, in one case, there was an administrator uh, for the enrollment management that was uh, administrators that were helping to run that. Uh, some of the enrollment management folks, for example, from student affairs and so on. And each of those task forces then met uh, five times over the spring semester to generate recommendations. In the end, um, the final report produced 40 recommendations, some of which are very similar to the ones that are coming out in your strategic plan. You know, the issue of trying to reduce bu bureaucracy, break down silos, some of those things. So um, 40 recommendations were advanced, and then my role was then to take these recommendations and vet them with the cabinet, with the deans, with the other associate vice presidents, and ultimately, the implementation plan now says that we can move forward on the majority of those. Um, I think there were six of the plan, uh, recommendations that are already in existence, already moving forward. Um, and there were four that I think that needed some clarification, but all the others were saying, yes, we have approval, or yes, let's move, consider this for implementation. So um, that's where we're at at the present time. So we did have another campus-wide forum um, this fall to release the final report, and, um, and then now we're taking steps to systematically go through that with the cabinet and with the, the deans and so on. So um, there was a lot of hoopla at the beginning because some other campuses, I do know, originally there were I think five or six campuses that George told me from the CSU that had signed on. And I think we're the only campus left standing because remember the budget hit at this point and people just said, no time, I just don't want to have any more time to do any of this stuff. But what was interesting on our campus is because we had a pretty clear structure with the committees and the committees were being run by faculty, um, faculty continued to come to those meetings and they would then write me back and say, you know, this is such an important thing because nowhere else on campus can we think about anything positive. Everywhere on campus we have to think about cutting cutting here, budget cuts there, and it's all doom and gloom. So this is the one place, the red balloon was the one place where you could envision, reimagine, and think positively. 
So, and again, um, I don't know that everybody, you know, we have 1,109 faculty, including both part-time and full-time and tenure, tenure track. Not all of them are tuned into the Red Balloon, but certainly at, the, at least a core of 200 uh, were with this process and, you know, have made a difference. So thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yes, come on down. Hi, I'm Jane Cohen, Director of the School of oh, Nursing. Oh, Jane, of course. And we've been working on video conferencing. <laughs> yes, we've only nice met on you. webinars, so yes, nice, to meet, <laughs> nice to meet you. Yes. Uh, my question today yes. is, um, you've had a chance to assess mm -hmm. our campus, and I'd like to know what you think the three major challenges are on the academic side, and based on those challenges in your assessment, what would you do to address them? Very good question. Three major challenges and what to do. Um, I think there are so many things that are pressing in this day, this, this particular time in history, uh, because, as I said, the shrinking commitment of the state to um, the CSU and to our students and to our institutions. So it is, when I say the new normal, it, that, is, that is a truism. It's sort of a, a catchphrase that's being tossed about in the public um, and in business industry sectors, but it is true. Our way of life of thinking of the way of, of previous funding is no longer um, being supported by reality. So I think one of the greatest challenges is for us to not hunker down and say, we can't do it, we can't do it. Instead, I would rather see the campus as a whole, and particularly, you know, everybody, faculty, staff, students, think about how we can rethink the way we have done things in a way that is going to be revenue conscious, but at the core must always be how do we protect the quality of the education here at San Jose, right? As, as budgets go down, people start thinking, oh, well, I can't do this anymore, I can't do that anymore, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to be more creative about thinking of what we can do um, in innovative ways. And thinking outside the box is not easy. I mean, higher ed has been in the making for centuries. It's one of the oldest institutions on the planet. So it is highly resistant to change. Um, but we can, I know we have the capacity to think differently. And some of the things that I have been trying to uh, move in the area of thinking innovatively is to really get down to the level of uh, the core disciplines. I mean, all of us here, if you have a PhD and you're a faculty member, you are part of a discipline, you are part of a tradition. And the way in which you were trained, the courses you took to get your degree were courses that you took when you were an undergrad or a grad student. So the question to, to me now is, is faculty sitting down carefully and examining your curriculum and saying, what is different about today's world that we can do in a new way with our existing curriculum? And how can we reshape and teach those courses, those skills, whatever, so that our students walk out of here, um, well-educated person who has commitment to everything from the community to ethics and to service, all of those things we want to be part of a package for our students. So finding the creative um, you know, stamina of our faculty to really engage with your colleagues on how you want your discipline to look for a San Jose graduate. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a San Jose graduate? Yes, we're all part of the CSU, but how is San Jose distinctive from the rest of the other CSUs. There are so many ways in which San Jose could be distinctive because of the locality, the region, your composition as a faculty and as a staff here. Um, so, but having those conversations is not easy. And uh, being able to really think differently is a key element. But giving permission to think differently is also a key element. Sometimes people don't think they have the permission to think, well, what if we teach this course in a different way? Why is it that we only have this course that has this number of students that has to be taught in that fashion? Is there another way to do it? Is there, and, and I'm using technology uh, to also see how we can support some of those changes. So we're trying different pilots, different experiments. And some of these experiments, as I said, have already shown promise to the extent that, you know, Gates and Carnegie Mellon and others are saying, yeah, let's, let's explore this further because Cal State is very diverse. We have very diverse student body. The work that we can generate from the, our population of students is going to be snapped up across the nation where their diversity is increasing elsewhere, whether it be Iowa or Maine or wherever it might be. So that's uh, issue number one. 
Um, issue number two, challenge, is, of course, morale. I haven't had enough of a chance to understand where your morale is. I think relative to most of the CSUs, um, I would say that San Jose appears to be in a better state than some of the others. Some of your counterparts, if you sit on the Senate, you can hear lots of uh, difficult dialogue happening at other campuses where their, their baseline funding is much more in jeopardy, much thinner, much more in jeopardy. Um, and in terms of also student enrollment, if students are not flocking to your campus, how are you going to maintain your FTES and so forth? So um, issues of morale are also very important. And I think with the, you know, the advent of your new president, you know, with, with new leadership comes the opportunity to think positively, to, to try and do more to respond to the, uh, I think, unmet potential of, of, of those that are all, have been on the campus, whether you've been here one year, two years, or 20 or 40 years. So um, morale is something that I would want to desperately um, pay more attention to. Um, <clears throat> the third issue is recognition, recognition and distinction. Um, you know, different campuses have different ways of recognizing outstanding contributions of individuals and of groups. And in surfing your website, um, I don't see as much. I mean, some of those things I noticed it was in your diversity master plan. There was supposed to be some sort of a ceremony of, of recognition. I don't know. Did that happen? Are you doing that? Not really? You did it just once? It was the first. All right. So that was just last year? It was the second year. Is that being met with good response? Are people? Yes and no. <laughs> just true of most initiatives. There's a yes and there's always a no. <laughs> Which is true. That's just human life. But, um, but yes. Yeah, so I think that there is the, and I don't know, uh, you know, I haven't had much chance to surf your human resources website, but I don't know how much support there is for staff in terms of professional development, training, professional development, growth opportunities. Another area is leadership. You know, to what extent does a campus have programs to help support uh, emerging leaders or to grow leaders for the future? Um, those are issues that were not immediately apparent to me when I looked through your website. And of course, your website just changed completely. <laughs> it was sort of shocking to log on the other day and it's, oh, it's all different and can't find things so easily. But. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but, you know, websites, websites are, and I, I should say academic technology, information technology is such a critical feature of any organization, especially an organization of this size with 29,000 students and, no, oh, I don't know, you might have about 3,000 uh, faculty staff, 4,000 faculty and staff altogether. So, because the web is not only an internal device that you use to keep up on what's going on internally, but it's your external face to the world, to the world. So it should reflect the power of what is here at, at San Jose. And it's a difficult thing to keep track of all of those things, because someone has to have the, you know, the skills to be able to do the webmaster stuff, someone has to have the content knowledge to feed to the webmaster, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's another issue. But, um, so actually that's maybe four, <laughs> so. Good morning, Dr. Jim. Yes. Welcome to San Jose State. Um, my name is Stanley Vaughn and I uh, work in the Office of the Dean of the College of Science yes. in managing our facilities. Yes. And my question to you is, uh, what is your opinion of the proposal to uh, have the College of Math and, and Science uh, <laughs> merge with uh, or as be, as become assimilated in the yes. College of, of, uh, of Agriculture at Fresno State. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know uh, if you had a role in that proposal and, and your opinion of it. Sure. Okay, Pleasure you. meeting you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, for those of you who do not know, uh, Fresno State is in the midst of trying to um, make budget reductions within academic affairs, within the Division of Academic Affairs. Um, and uh, this past year, uh, the academic affairs, there is a gap of roughly $2 million. And as a result, um, all the other divisions, the other VPs, have taken their cuts already, so they, they're not going through the process. This is only, uh, you know, involving academic affairs, per se. So as a result, uh, the provost decided to create a um, task force, a special task force, primarily of academic affairs individuals, including a wide array of faculty. Uh, it is co-chaired by the Senate chair, Michael Caldwell, and by the, um, the AVP for academic programs, which also includes budget. Uh, personnel. 
And um, it's, I think it's about 12 or 14 members on this committee. So they spent um, essentially the last uh, almost a year now reviewing um, academic affairs budgets, trying to consider different plans and alternatives. Um, and the, 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 the proposal to which, is it Frank? Stanley, Stanley excuse me. Stanley refers to, <laughs> sorry, not close. Um, the, the proposal you refer to is that there are about 10 recommendations in the report. The, but the report, the recommendation that's garnering the most interest, speculation, and concern is the first one. The first principle was to try and reduce administrative cost. Well, what does that really mean? Administrative costs means you cut administrators, correct? So who could you cut? Uh, the provost has already cut 9.5 um, MPP positions within the provost's office, and some of those positions are duties which I, for example, now um, you know have assumed. Um, so three people, uh, you know, have now um, are, are doing those jobs from from additional sources, and so and that's happened throughout academic affairs on the provost end. So this question was to say, um, could there be a consolidation of colleges? And that's what the committee. Uh, wrestled with. And then bear in mind that this is not recommendation coming from the provost. This is a separate committee that he charged with considering alternatives. As, as you may or may not know, San Francisco State has engaged in a similar process, but they have done a completely wild thing. Did you ever go online? You could go online and create your own college. Did you know that? You, it's a little thing on the line. You could, you could click. All the departments are listed. You could put whatever name you wanted for the college that you would design. And, it, and so everybody on campus was allowed to try their own thing. I think the only thing is that they said that they had to maintain a college that had to do with the social justice and advocacy piece because that's a central uh, distinctive value of the campus there. But everything else was up for grabs. So uh, rather than doing the calculator notion, this committee came up with the concept of consolidating colleges. And they were consolidating from uh, eight colleges down to six. So one thing that they were advocating was uh, making use of um, a historical, I don't know if you can call it an accident, a historical um, situation. That is to say, the dean of the College of Science and Math in July left to become the provost at Sonoma State. At the same time, quite independently, his associate dean left to become the dean of science and math at Chico State. So that meant they were both deanless and associate deanless, right? So <laughs> the question was, is there an opportunity to somehow reconfigure situations so that um, they could be consolidated, but um, in some you know, mutually beneficial way? But when you talk about that, people automatically in, in assumed that meant they were being out of existence. Well, as I, I told, I think, the cabinet this morning here, um, that is lunacy. There is no provost anywhere at a higher institution worth its ilk who would ever get rid of science and math. That is simply impossible, right? So this was a, a recommendation from the committee to consider different alternate arrangements. But, but on the face of it, when people hear that, it sounds terrible. It sounds like they're saying, get rid of science and math. And that's, I don't think, was what the committee intended. Uh, I did not sit on this committee, so I did not have a direct role. The provost is right now engaged in what he's calling his listening campaign. So he is meeting with each college. He's met with some of the colleges twice at their request. So science and math had two, two uh, forums with the provost and with the members of the committee, the budget committee. And there will be no rash decision making. Um, he will listen very carefully, certainly to alternatives. So if the College of Science and Math has a different idea, that he is waiting to have alternate, uh, you know, suggestions, implementation plans, and so forth. So the jury's still out, and he will not make a rash decision. We'll have all of the spring again to make those um, decisions. But in the meantime, of course, the airwaves and the email waves have been full of speculation on it. But so to answer your question. Say it again? Well, uh, I think that the, the, the question of succession is a separate question. That is an operational question. The first question you need to tackle is conceptually, does this make sense? In what form could you create a merger that makes sense, curricularly, research-based, faculty, et cetera, right? And then, once you make that decision, then you leave aside 
the question of how and who do you choose to be the dean, right? So that is a second operational question. Conceptually, the, the larger picture has to be addressed first. Yes. Thank you yes. for coming. I'm Lucy yes. Sievertson. I'm in Counseling Services. Yes. Uh, I, well, a couple of things. Uh, we did have a uh, kind of celebration for those who were involved in doing programs for diversity a couple yes. of weeks here on campus. It was really quite successful. Oh, great. We, inter we, we gave honor to someone from the faculty, somebody from the staff, a student, and an administrator as a part of our campus climate process. The other thing I want to mention is that on our we have a unity council on, on our campus uh -huh. as well, uh -huh. but we include also gay, lesbian, bi, and transgender yes. students. And I'm hoping to include the, um, the vets that are coming back from, from overseas because I think they have a unique capacity and mm -hmm. people with disabilities. And we also include religious groups on, in our council. That's fabulous. Yes. So but I, I'm, I'm from Student Affairs. Yes. And, and I know that if you did, you did get on the website, I'm so not glad that you know something about websites because if you tried to find Student <laughs> Affairs, it is somewhere in the hinterland across oh, town in another website because it's certainly not visible on ours. I see. And, and that, that brings me to that issue yes. of how would you as a provost yes. consistently consider Student Affairs uh -huh. as, a, as a viable, I oftentimes think of the campus as living in a cul-de-sac with the four houses, academic affairs, student affairs, et cetera. And I'm wondering what you would do. And also, we have just recently completed almost two years a struggle to, to recreate a, an EOP on this campus. Oh. And, and at the present time, have, oh. have one that is really operating at a very, very high level with a very good director. But I'm wondering how you would continue mm -hmm. to support that program mm -hmm. so that it will go on, because it did kind of die for a while. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, and again, I, have to, I am indebted to my current campus for offering me a, a different model of relationships between academic affairs and student affairs. Um, typically, in many institutions of higher ed across the nation, uh, and even within the CSU, student affairs and academic affairs operate um, at, in tandem, you know, in parallel, right? Um, and sometimes I will have my student affairs colleagues say, oh, well, we feel like the stepchild, that they don't have as much um, you know, visibility or status or whatever it might be. And what I want to say is that at Fresno State, we have a different model that I think, um, you know, depending on how, you know, this campus would feel, the model is much more collaborative. So, for example, um, the Vice President for Student Affairs actually sits on the Provost leadership team with the deans, with the AVPs. He, uh, he happens to be a he, uh, Paul Oliaro. Uh, sits with us and, and is in part is part of all of our decision making when it comes to academic affairs um, uh, matters, and and that is an absolutely critical uh, relationship because we need student affairs to augment and su support the things that we're doing in the academic side of the house. Um, I can say that I also extend that support in my role as SATO, the Senior Academic Technology Officer. So last week, I um, actually signed a contract with a new product, a vendor called Grades First. It is an online, um, have you heard of it? Are you using it here? <coughs> oh. It is in places. In places. Yeah. Ah, student athletic, right. It was originally designed for athletics, but it is generalizable to the academic side of the house for advising. And student affairs, you know, only gets 6.97 percent of the budget at um, Fresno State. So it, relative to academic affairs, we get 69.97, so 70 percent of the budget. So their budget is much more constrained. So as SATO, I paid for grades first for the entire campus, and uh, student affairs is going to be accessing it first. They'll, they'll start utilizing it. Um, in December. We have our first uh, training meeting in October 30th. Actually, someone should let me know who's using it, who's a good person, because I'd like to talk to other people in the CSU who are using it. I know Long Beach State is using it for their athletics programs, but um, we have piloted it with our athletics at Fresno State. It has reduced the no-show rate to almost zero. It was shocking because the, this program allows students to um, get text messages so uh, they don't often read their email and this makes sure that they show up for their appointments, they know who their advisor is. We can log all that information and it can also be sent for, um, you know, the Title IX, um, you know, uh, uh, documenting efforts as well. So we're going to roll it out at the, at the um, academic level too, so we'll see. So in other words, um, my view in terms of student affairs is they are critical 
partner, and they must be at the table with us and knowledgeable about the things that we're launching on the academic side of the house. And it's been absolutely critical with our graduation rate initiative, which is something that the chancellor's office um, you know, uh, is, has launched uh, several years ago. And um, together, I will give you another example, is both our provost and our student vice president for student affairs together co-chair our student success task force, our graduation rate initiative, and they go to the chancellor's office as co-chairs as well. So that equal partnership is very important um, in my view. Yes. Hello. Uh, oh, say, what's your name? Uh, Jeremy. Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. We said, uh, the uh, teacher told me, uh, very happy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm not here for myself. I'm actually here Are from you speaking in Mandarin and, and okay. Cantonese. Sorry. Cantonese. Well, but, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm not Chinese. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> How embarrassing. I'm really Swedish. <laughs> no, I'm. <laughs> no, I say that. I say it in jest because I'm from the Midwest. I was born and raised in Illinois, right? And as growing up, people would always say, where did you learn to speak English so beautifully? <laughs> where are you from? And I would say, well, I'm from Michigan. I grew up mostly in Michigan. And, I, and then they'd say, no, where are you really from? Well, I was born in Illinois. Where are you really from? And I'd say, Sweden? Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so I'm actually Korean. My parents are oh, Korean, I'm but sorry. I was born and raised. I'm sorry. But I, I understood Ni Hao because I went to China for the first time this June. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I love the country. It's a very, very interesting country. Konsamada. Oh, come Sunday, da. Yes. I'm here actually not, not for myself to show off. Okay. I'm, I'm actually here for my nephew, yes. <laughs> who's yes. Brandon Yasuhara. He's, yes. he's a freshman this year, and he, his grandparents were interned, actually. Oh, yes. And, and uh, he's here uh, working uh, on his computer science degree. Yes. And I, I, last year, or a couple of years back, I, I uh, co chaired a conference with Jerry Hanley down yes, at the CSU. He's a fabulous guy. So I'm, I'm trying to connect the two yes. because. Um, You've published uh, 19 editions of the Growth and Children. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, how can I save them some money? I owe $110,000. I'm sorry. Uh, I owe $110,000. It's 7% owe... interest that I can't default on that the government guarantees. You mean in student loans? Yeah. How How did you accumulate? I have a doctorate how... two years ago. Oh. So from... th thanks with support from Dr. Novak. Oh, I see. I see. Well, That's my question. I'll sit down. So your question, tell me again, is. My question is, um, how can you save the students money using technology? Oh, using technology. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, very interesting question. And actually, the Chancellor's Office it should be credited, and Jerry Henley's leadership should be credited, uh, for uh, really seeking out aggressive solutions for what he calls affordability. All right. So if you go to the Chancellor's Office and click on Academic Technology, um, that is under the purview of Jerry Henley, you will find a website that is called Affordability. Under Affordability are everything from open source textbooks to um, other kinds of materials. Open source generally means it's free. You, you can download it off the web for free, and you can modify it if you have you know, the technical expertise you know, to build. So for example, Moodle is a, a, a free uh, system so-called free. It's not really free because if you really understand Moodle, San Francisco State is probably the leader in developing Moodle, but uh, I talked to Maggie Beers, who's my counterpart at San Francisco State. She has 90 people reporting to her. I have 10. And when of, of her 90 people, at least half of them are things like network analysts, programmers, and so forth. And they are actively involved in shaping, changing the open source uh, language so that it can be branded for San Francisco State, right? So they have to take the open source and create uh, modules and the things that faculty want in their learning management system uh, instead of your, your uh, D2L campus here, right? Desire to learn, yeah. correct? Um, my campus is uh, Blackboard campus. So what I'm trying to say here is that um, what Jerry Henley is trying to do and what I also have been doing in my role as academic technology um, uh, officer is to help faculty understand that there are open source textbooks, that is, there's textbooks out there that are free. Um, and you can go and look at the list. Now here's the problem, is that some of those textbooks uh, may not be at the caliber level that a faculty member might like. Maybe it's not written by a famous, if you're a political scientist or if you're, you know, a social worker, whatever you might be. They're, they're, but they're, those textbooks exist out there. And so the, the push is to try and help faculty identify high quality 
open source materials that students can download and they would not have to pay $150 for a textbook um, for you know, multiple classes and so on. But it does take time um, and that's part of the issue. The other area that he also is working on is e-textbooks. Um, right now the market is so volatile, it's unclear who's going to be the major leader, both in terms of the e-textbooks as well as the mechanism by which you read an e-textbook, whether it be as a tablet, an iPad, or whatnot. And um, so the e-textbooks can save students money because you pay, depending on who you go with, you can pay 40% less than you would for a hardcover book. Now, I talked to Cecile yesterday. She doesn't buy any of her textbooks online. Uh, she prefers the hard, court, hard version. And nationally, students have not uh, jumped onto the e-textbook bandwagon yet. Somehow there's still a tendency to want to buy the real thing, even though they will, in most cases, go back and send it the, min the minute the class is over, right? Go back and sell it back. Um, the e-textbook uh, you know, field is growing, and the thing that's very cool about it is the publishers are now making it possible for students, when they open the textbook, depending on what device you're reading off of, you can add uh, notes, you can add, you can cut and, and save pieces, you can send it to people, you can do lots more interactive things with it um, that would enhance your learning rather than just taking out the highlighter and highlighting like in the old days. Uh, there are bookmarks that you can bookmark, you can uh, skip here and there and so forth. So, um, but that's in the area of the affordability of, of materials. Now, the, to make it uh, less expensive for students in terms of the tuition, as you know, um, no president has any power to reduce tuition. That is something that is um, between the chancellor and the board of trustees. So the best way, if you are seeking tuition um, assistance, the best way you can do that is by, uh, unfortunately, it is by um, advocating for uh, greater support for, for students in the CSU by working with your legislators and by working with the Board of Trustees and um, the Chancellor himself. Now the Chancellor, of course, is, is very cognizant about these issues, uh, but it is a very difficult climate, as you can imagine. And um, I'm not even sure that legislators, even if you had, there, you know, there's 420,000 of you in the system. Even if all 420,000 of you and your parents lobbied the legislature, I don't know that they would listen because the state of California's economy is so in such dire straits. I mean, we're likely to hit the, not reach the trigger this December, and the CSU is looking at another $100 million cut. So um, the kinds of cuts that we're seeing are beyond imaginable. Um, but the other thing that I can say is that, um, you know, as a provost, or certainly in my role as associate provost, the thing that I'm constantly doing is looking for external sources of revenue. By um, grants, unfortunately, are one time; they are not sustainable. Right? I brought in this 3.187 million, but it will only last five years, and then it's gone. So we have to develop new ways to think about how to generate revenue, and some of that is through continuing global ed. Some of that is through other uh, partnerships with industry and business to get money to help students with internships, with other kinds of career development kinds of things as well. Um, certainly financial literacy is something that we can help students with as well. Those are all issues that have to be addressed in, in there's no one cure. It's a big menu. It's a big problem that got us here. It will be no one magic bullet. This is the last question. A short one. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Veronica? Um, yeah. Okay. I'm a student here yes. at San Jose State. Um, I just want to know, like, how are you planning to get the student feedback for the changes that you want to make? How to get student feedback? Okay. Very good question. Um, you know, all CSUs have an ASI, right? Associated Students Incorporated. <laughs> and that is an elected representative um, body um, that generally has a network and a process and procedure for how to. Uh, involve students, but that's only one small segment. The students who get in a, involved in ASI are not the majority. So I think um, certainly getting student feedback through ASI is a tried and true method of getting feedback. But in addition, I think you have to get feedback from students in more informal capacities. And depending on the, the issue, that can be achieved in a variety of different ways. One way, of course, is to mobilize students through uh, their home departments, because students are most familiar with the department in which they're affiliated. And uh, so if they can mobilize through departmental associations, through uh, you know, communications that come from their faculty about how to get information, that that would be another vehicle. 
Um, in addition, there are, any campus has a minimum of, I don't know exactly, I didn't count how many uh, student organizations you have on this campus, but my guess is it's gonna be over 200 student organizations of, of all sorts and types, and there are ways to reach and communicate with all those student leaders as well, many of whom have no affiliation directly with ASI, right? Um, and uh, the other thing, of course, is Ask the students themselves. I mean, you guys, you do your texting, you do your Facebook, you do all of the social media stuff. So there are many ways. And again, I don't know, it's as, uh, not as much detailed in how this campus uses IT. Social, uh, I mean, I understand that your web services appears to be under your IT, but sometimes web services uh, can be aligned under advancement, under the um, communications. Usually there's a communications department under advancement. And they can be also experts in helping to mobilize these communications. So I think um, that there are multiple ways to vehicles to, by which to get student input. But there has to be a structure. What is it you want students to respond to? What is it you're giving students ownership of? How do you want to get them involved? Will there be a committee structure? Will it be more open-ended? Multiple, multiple ways. But it depends on the issue. You pick the issue, then you get the right people around the table to talk about how to frame that issue, how to gather the data, how to implement it, how to assess if that has made an impact. Okay, does that answer your question? Do you have ideas? How would you like to find, put in input? Do, you, do students here prefer to talk with people, to email people, to go to meetings? I think the issue, um, what I respond most to is like when I get the emails about the surveys. Yes. Um, especially about like presentations and things like that, I respond to those. Good. No time? Yes, I think surveys would be a good way. Surveys are a good way. You're also a student? Mm -hmm. you, you agree? Or are you more of a meeting person? I'm not a, uh, no, because meeting takes up time. Takes up time. <laughs> <laughs> I know, none of us have enough hours. Oh, yes, another student back here. Student, I would just like to say, um, uh -huh. I don't think I'm very uh, good communication on this campus. I'm not so organized. I usually do some browsing around my phone every day. <laughs> I know, I had zero. Yes. So just being able to reach out maybe more, whether or not they're through um, yes. technology, even just word of mouth, I really do uh, find it to be more meaningful than someone texting or mm. calling me. Very good. I mean, one thing that I have toyed with the idea is, I don't know if you know this, but President Welty, he's been on campus 21 years, and he actually puts out a, um, it's not really, he doesn't, He's not totally a techno person, so we, we have tried on the cabinet to get him to tweet. He refuses to tweet. Um, <laughs> but he is a technology, he understands the power of technology. In fact, he's the chair of the, the steering committee for the CSU Online. But um, what he does do is he prints out every week a synopsis of all the things, activities and um, information that he's been doing, the issues that he's confronting that week, day by day. And when I first came to that campus, I said, President Welty, how long have you been doing this? Oh, 21 years. I said, oh my gosh, you could write a book about you know, his, the, the work that he has done, the legacy he has accrued for 21 years on this level. So I think there are ways in which um, those of us in senior administration should be out there more visibly letting people know um, what we are doing, maybe not on a day-to-day, week-by-week basis, but certainly in some way that is um, predictable, sustainable, and um, you know, it, it's more transparent that way. Does that help? Okay. Oh yes. Thanks, Dr. Young. <laughs> Can we say thank you to Dr. Young, please? <laughs> thank you. Thank you.